I'm Paul Johnson and I'm here today with Paul Estabrooks and Jim Cunningham, co-authors of Standing Strong Through the Storm. I was wondering, having traveled to many locations to share Standing Strong Through the Storm, if you could share some of the life lessons that you've learned outside of the material you're presenting. Whoa, stories. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the part this where is it could take, okay. take all, af all afternoon, all you, evening, you gotta, you gotta all tell day tomorrow. Rest, you got to tell Yeah, okay. Uh, Jim and I were doing seminars in, in uh, Central Asia, probably not wise to mention the country initially, and our director there said, could you go to the country to the south, which is Tajikistan, and do a seminar there as well? And um, we said, well, okay, uh, it'll take three extra days on our schedule, but um, he, there were to be 40 people there that were really anxious to have this experience. And so we agreed. We arrived there after a very interesting journey. Yes, that was the yellow submarine. We had a Russian guy pick us up, mm -hmm. a Russian-speaking person pick us up at the border and drive us across almost desert-like conditions. And he was very proud of the fact. I have English cassette, he says, English cassette, a cassette which he pops into his car cassette player. So you know how old his car was. It had a cassette player. and. And and it was uh, the Beatles. It was all songs of the Beatles. We and all so, live in a yellow submarine. So we're going, we're going across the desert singing these Beatles songs at the top of our voice. For 90 minutes. We arrive in, in the, the capital and they, the leader of the group said, we have big problem. We no find interpreter for you in our language. But we find a lady who can speak Russian and English. And so we hire her. Her name is Larissa. So Jim and I meet Larissa. <laughs> there were just a few problems with Larissa. Number one, she was not a Christian. Number two, she had never read the Bible. And number three, her English was horrible. I mean, Niet, it was Niet pathetic. Problemski, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was terrible. And she did not understand even the word forgiveness, uh, grace, mm. any of these kind of terminologies that we Christians use, you know, every other word almost. And we had a really difficult time. I mean, it was, it was tough. Three days. The only saving grace for the group that were there was that they didn't know each other before. These were believers from all over the country who came and had fellowship mm. together for the first time. And they did all their worship, literally their music worship in the morning in Tajik, their language. Uh, they did devotions in Tajik. They, of course, when they had meals, they all had good fellowship. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a benefit for them, but they, I, I don't think they learned anything at this seminar because our, we spent all our time trying to, trying to get through the translator what we wanted to share. <laughs> and I remember, to my shame, going home on the plane and telling Jim, I don't think that lasts seminar was worth our time. We should have just gone home. Uh, years go by, six years to be exact, and we go back to the area, to another country where they're bringing all of the, the uh, future trainers of SSTS together to have uh, a training seminar. In fact, it was, it was really significant because they even had Uyghur people from Western China there, as well as all through Central Asia. And on the second day, a young boy comes up to us and he says, I'm from the Tajik group from Tajikistan. He said, you don't know me, but you know my mother. I said, we do? He said, yes, my mother's name is Larissa. <laughs> and I'm, I remember rolling my eyes thinking, oh man, who could ever forget Larissa? And then he said, after the seminar, my mother got a hold of a Bible uh, she read the Bible all the way through, and she led all of her family to faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he says, now I, her son, am here to learn how to teach this course in the, the, in the Tajik language mm -hmm. when I go back to my home country. Uh, and uh, I just thought, oh, Lord, God, God is good all the time. This is good as we tell the story. Um, even when we think uh, time is a waste of time, we later find out that um, it was it was really she we were there for, not the 40 people that we were trying to thinking we were supposed to teach. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, one, one of the, I guess one of the battles I have in North America is dealing with materialism and how to live in an affluent society like we do here in North America, in my area. And when I go overseas, I see people that love Jesus Christ, love the church, are bold in their evangelism, and extreme levels of poverty, and less than, than I have in North America. And the contentment that I see and the joy that I see is contagious when you're with them. I mean, it's just a, a sense of the, these people, whether we've been in South Sudan with, with believers there, that the, the, the country has no electricity, no asphalt roads, uh, no power points, no, none of the typical North American affluence, and yet they just abundantly love Jesus Christ and are full of joy. So when I look at that, I, it just keeps uh, refreshing me any time I go, whether it's with Paul or with uh, Rita, my wife, and you know, you know my wife, Paul, <laughs> so I can't say that, but you know her. And when we go, we come back with great joy and a sense of, aren't we blessed? We are really, really mm. blessed here in North America uh, to have freedom, to have liberty, to have opportunity, to have communication skills um, with people uh, that we can share our faith. What we lack in this country, for me, is boldness to actually do it. Mm. Very true. Uh, I think, and I think in my case, um, uh, studying the curriculum for first SSTS, then our theology of uh, persecution and discipleship course, has, has taken me on a journey, even academically, that I don't think I ever would have done before. And that is primarily in the area of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. the, the Christian community historically has been divided on war, on the issue of fighting and war. You have one group who, who are basically pacifists, and you have another group who believe in what is called just war that uh, Augustine uh, developed back in his time. Uh, and these are the dominantly two views of war and fighting that exist. So there is no unified view of, of war or fighting or responding to war in, in uh, Christian uh, communities. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide which you're going to. I was brought up in a, in, in a community that believed in just war. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just after the Second World War. Yeah. And just war, it, it was the philosophy that my father, who was a pastor, accepted and the Bible school that Jim and I went to would have probably taught that if you asked them about what issue. So in, in working with areas where Christians are, are being attacked, how, how do they decide how to respond to these attacks? Uh, I've, been, I've been studying uh, where Christians have been involved in nonviolence. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not meaning pacifism. I'm not meaning that you, you, you do nothing uh, in, a, in a passive way. But active, what they call active love or aggressive love. Region, and please. I think of um, even issues like in Palestinian Israel where Christians will demonstrate, but they will never throw a stone, for example, right. which the kids do there. Or they will never do any kind of violent act. But as Christians who feel they're being, that the, the, there's injustice in their experience, uh, they do it in a nonviolent way. And so the, the whole nonviolent movement, which of course was, was popularized really by Mahatma Gandhi, and then in North America was, was, became very, very well known through Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that whole aspect of of uh, the Christian view of nonviolence, which I feel parallels Jesus' teachings very closely, has been something that, um, that has blessed me in studying it in my own life. Yeah. Now, having traveled, and um, we know that that always gives opportunities for, for fellowship and, and growth, but I'd sure love to, to hear from you about some of the funny things that have happened to you as a result of having to share standing strong through the storm. All right, I, I gotta tell this one. <laughs> All right, you go first. We, uh, before, Paul and I are gonna be going to northern Iraq, to Erbil up in Kurdistan. And then, so the night before we go, 
Rita prepares a nice dinner and we sit down and she says, hey, I got this uh, film called The Illusionist. I'd like us to, you know, let's watch it. She said, I heard it's a good movie. And it is. Great movie. I'd recommend it. So <laughs> we, we watch this movie about an illusionist who makes things disappear. Fine. I get on the plane, fly to Istanbul, meet Paul. We check into the hotel. And the next morning uh, is Sunday, so we're going to go to church. So we said to the, we go, we get in the yellow cab. And we know where the church is on the map, and it should be this direction. And now we see on the map that he's sort of driving the long way. So I look at Paul and say, I think we're getting the scenic route. You know, what should have cost a few dollars is now costing many dollars. So we get to the end of the car ride, and uh, the driver says to him the price. It was uh, five lira, uh, no, sorry, 39 lira, whatever. And uh, Paul says, well, I have a 50 lira. And uh, he says, well, you give it to me and I'll give you change. So Paul hands him his 50 lira bill. And uh, he, at that moment, says, turns around and says, oh, do you see where you're going over here? And he, and he points to the, where the church is. <laughs> and while he points to the church, he goes, oh. And then he says, um, no, I, uh, do you have any American money? I don't have enough change here. So I said to Paul, oh, I said, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm the big hero. That, see, I said to Paul, yeah, I got a $100 bill. I said, I'll get it changed into lira. So fine. So I hand this guy my $100 bill. And he then turns around and says, now, do you, do, you, do you see where you're going? Your church is right down that alley. And now we turn around. We both look out the window again. And he then says, oh, wait a second. I got a better idea. He says, here's your 100 back. And he said, uh, uh, here's your change. Uh, he says, give me, if you, got for, if you got $40 American, and we had 40 American. So we gave it to him or whatever. And he gives back the change. And he says, here's your, here's your 50 lira back and here's your 100 back. He says, I'll do it that way. That's easier, easier. And he's just chacking away, talking about this. So we go to church. Nice church service. We decide to walk home. We walk home. We go into the drugstore to buy some toothpaste. Toothpaste. <laughs> Paul hands the, uh, 50, the, the lira. 50 lira note to the, uh, to the attendant. And he gets back uh, one lira change. for a, uh, No, he got back... One lira because it was four lira. Mm -hmm. And he says, where's the rest of my change? He says, sir, you only gave me a five lira. <laughs> and I, we both looked at each other and said, five? We, get, you know, he, we just gave you a 50. He says, look, I hope my kill. He said, there's no 50 in here. There's only a five. And he shows us a still. We both look at each other and say, that turkey oh. taxi driver kept the 50 lira and switched it and gave back a five. Yeah. So we thought, oh, we got taken by this taxi driver. So we go back to the hotel. We have two separate rooms in the hotel. We lie down, we have a nap, and I wake up and I'm feeling so compassionate for my brother who's lost all this money, you know. So I go knocking on his door and I says, hey, I said, I feel really bad. I said, I've got, you know, I still got my $100 bill. I said, why don't we split the loss here? And I said, I owe you some money anyway. So I reach into my pocket and I pull out and I says, here, Pablo, here, take the 100 okay? And, and he takes, he opens up the 100 It's a $1 bill. <laughs> These these <laughs> worldwide travelers, worldwide these tra these seasoned the veteran seasoned travelers, travelers who have been all over the world and how many countries, we both got taken by the same taxi driver on the yes. same day in the same cab. Yeah. So we thought, okay. Then the funny part for me is we get on the plane, we fly to Ir Erbil in Kurdistan, where we're going to be teaching a seminar with the Kurdish people uh, in, in that area with SSDS. We get off the plane, they drive us to this nice new hotel that had been built. We go through and there's a Fox News channel on the on front and it's playing a movie. And guess what the movie was? The Illusionist. <laughs> <laughs> so the Dutch brother we who's with him. us, he looks at he says, now that's a training film for Turkish taxi drivers. <laughs> How do you envision um, you seeing the future take standing strong through the storm and continue its impact into the next decade? Well, I think the biggest thing for us for the next decade is to see a development of new teachers and a younger generation that are getting involved. Um, obviously, Jim and I are not going to be able to do this forever, forever, although we would like to think we could. I mean, we still feel energetic and young enough to keep doing it. Kill and Joshua. Yeah, but it's uh, obviously our time is going to lapse when we won't be able to do it anymore. And so 
uh, our vision for the next decade mm -hmm. is to see a host of new young trainers developed who mm -hmm. will be involved in teaching all of these materials. And it's beginning. I mean, as we did the uh, seminary course last May, we mm -hmm. had two uh, of the Open Doors people, a young lady from the UK and a young man from South Africa, uh, come and, and uh, uh, sit in on the course. And just the other day, we got an email that this young man from South Africa was invited to Australia. And in Australia, he had a meeting with the uh, seminaries mm -hmm. and Bible colleges of Australia to encourage them to include the study of persecution in their curriculum of their mm -hmm. school. And apparently it was a very successful uh, op time. And that's our, our dream. Our dream is that yeah. seminaries and schools will see the need of this course and even develop their own teachers, frankly, who, who will take the curriculum and the material and, and, uh, and to see it continue on. Why should I attend this SSTS seminar? It's a great question, Paul, because when you think about where we are at, when you're in a country where there is no persecution, as we say, where it's mild to use to use mm -hmm. him like buds. He likes this mild chili curry. one about hot curry, mild chili, a week, <laughs> you know, mild, medium, and whatever. Well, it's mild in Canada at the moment. But like we said in Red Skies at Dawn, we see the future changing. It's changing by the day. It's just, we just, I mean, you just don't recognize it in, on daily increments until you step back and see what changes there's been, say, in 10 years. 10 years in, from now, who knows where this country and other countries that are currently free might be? I just looked at a, a report recently that showed, it, like for example, we're all Canadians, so let's let's talk about Canada for a few seconds here. The number of there, there's been four census taken in this country in, in like back in they took one in 2011 and they took one in 2001. Every 10 years they take a census, and uh, the Canadian census showed that 40 years ago the percentage of Christians, people who identified themselves in the census as Christians, <clears throat> was up around 80%. Well, now, 40 years later, it's at 67%. And the number of people who 40 years ago said they had no religion was just a little tiny sliver up there of a few percentage points. Now it's about 20 some percent, 28% or something, of the people say, I have no religion. They're not Muslim. They're not Hindu, they're not Buddhist, they're not Sikh or Jewish or Christian. They have no religion and they're, they're basically your secular humanists. Well, the more secular humanists that are into the media, you can guarantee then the more, the less sympathetic the media will be for Christian values, Christian perspectives, Christians, even the right of Christians to have certain jobs. Why would we want a Christian in that job? And it'll narrow, narrow, narrow down in terms of the acceptance. Whereas 40 years ago, that when, like when we, when we were kids, there was a broad base acceptance of basic common Christian values. And Chris, well, you, you know this from, from your experience living in this country too, that it's the same. It's the same. We've, we've, had, we've had freedom as, as Canadians and as Christians. But I, we see that as we look ahead, we see that changing. So why should you attend? Why not you, but why should anybody attend, Paul? It, it's because they need to be prepared for this. Because I, if I could just sort of say one thing, Paul and I have learned that it probably answers your question. The opposition is not to you as a Christian, Paul. The opposition is to Jesus Christ in you. They, 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 they know you're a Christian and they don't accept Jesus Christ. So it's really Jesus Christ that is the opposite. So all this secular, whatever, antagonism is not you're you're okay as a person i mean you're a nice guy we like you right he's a good that's guy that's right for sure <laughs> he's a we're nice guys we have you know we really like being alive in this country but they don't like jesus in us they see that as that we're a threat because we believe that jesus christ is the way the truth and the life and that no one comes to the father but by me that's the most controversial verse in the bible for secular humans to deal with because if you believe that then there's no other way. And that's the challenge. People who believe that need to then take the course to understand how do you prepare for it and how do you know how to respond positively and biblically. If you had opportunity to do it again, knowing what you know today, would you still put this much effort into standing strong through the storm? 
Yes, well, uh, let me answer that one. I would say that, uh, yes, the answer is yes, I would do it again, and mm. I would probably double the effort mm. uh, because uh, of not knowing when we started just how significant this, uh, the impact of this course was going to be and how many people it would impact and the, the blessing that it has been to a number of people. So if, if I were doing it again, yes, I would, I would double the effort. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Paul, for sharing with us um, stories, experiences, your calling, your heartbeat, and future of standing strong through the storm. I trust that this time of sharing and stories have been a tremendous blessing to you.